Hello. Welcome. Welcome to the Video Game Valley. It's a beautiful day today. A perfect 72 degrees out. You won't believe this. But we're playing Jackal on the Nintendo Entertainment System. Jackal. I don't think it's about a jackal. I think it's a war game. <laughs> I think it's a war game. This one was sent in by Charles. Thank you, Charles. Charles was kind enough to send in this video game for me. Jackal on the NES. I've got a green tea with me. Green tea with jasmine. Yeah, it tastes pretty good. Tastes kind of nice. How is everyone doing today? Hope you're all doing well. Hope things are going well for you out there in the world. Jason, this one is about using a heavily armored jeep to rescue POWs. I see. What does the jackal refer to? <laughs> What are the ja what are the jackals? No, oh, you know what? I'm I, I glanced up at the screen. There's a demo mode playing. And it mentioned the word jackal. I didn't read the context. But I'm gonna find out myself. Jackal Your brothers in arms are hostages behind enemy lines and you're their only hope for freedom. But the fire po oh We'll read it on the the next <laughs> the next go through. All right. You're the uh, only hope for freedom, but the firepower you'll face to rescue them is awesome. Rescue the oh. Let's wait until the next time around. And there we go. Just just wait a few more seconds. <clears throat> Rescue the POWs in the building. You'll need a pocket full of miracles and the ferocity of a wild jackal. Alright, we got it. Colonel Decker, Lieutenant Bob, Sergeant Quint... Corporal Gray. Okay, one player. This battle will make your blood boil. Good luck. Thank you. That was a bomb. Right, is that a... An enemy? Oh, I can only shoot up. I'm hoping that's an enemy, not a, a friend. I like this little jeep I'm in. Boop boop ba ba dee 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 boo boo. Da ba da ba da ba boo ba 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 boo. Yeah, look at those cool trees. Yeah, I'm just assuming all of these are enemies. Got him. Doop be de ba de ba be 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 ya boo boo. Scabba de ba de ba doo boo boo. Marcus, thank you for the two dollars. Can I get your feedback in my voice acting and VOD? Yeah, if I got if I got time, I'll I'll look that up. I generally don't like to rate stuff like that because 
Although I'm sure your voice acting is particularly good. <laughs> I, I don't know if I could give honest feedback if it's, if it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I've I've heard you do uh, voice stuff in uh, in games before, and it's been it's pretty good. You're generally uh, you got a good voice for streaming. Uh, I'm I'm supposed to do that. Oh, that's a POW. I got one. is bad voice acting. Oh. I think bad acting in general is just a matter of not accomplishing your artistic goals. <laughs> As with any art form. Got him, no problem. Everybody hear about Jesus coming back today? No, but I did hear about the Matrix turning 25. The Matrix is 25 years old today. It's 25 years old, the Matrix. Happy birthday to the Matrix, it's 25 today. The fact that I saw someone mention this online, but it is truly an extraordinary confluence of events that the Matrix turns 25 and it's Easter on Trans Day of Visibility. <laughs> the, the, the number of stars that had to align. <clears throat> I hope that was an enemy. <laughs> There's some cosmic significance to this. I don't know what it is. The fact that the uh, Matrix is, you know, uh, easy to read as a trans narrative, and then also uh, Neo as a Christ figure, and also specifically revolve <laughs> Easter and the uh, uh, Jesus in the cave the matrix is a Plato's cave analogy there's so much to unpack here <laughs> the number of coincidences for this day to have happened Oh, the Matrix is very good. <clears throat> I think, not only do I think the Matrix is very good, I think it's, uh... Occasionally people will say online, you know what, the Matrix doesn't hold up. <laughs> but I feel like the Matrix holds up, uh, kind of unbelievably well. I think it's one of the hold up movies. <laughs> most of the... Uh, most of the themes are still extremely relevant. that, but I feel like the filmmaking itself is 
still extraordinarily good. Alright. Seen Bound and Speed Racer many times. More of the Wachowski's genius. Two also excellent films. Second Matrix soundtrack is better than the movie itself. The, the Second Matrix movie is a movie that uh, has truly extraordinary elements to it. <laughs> the soundtrack being one of those things. It's weird that, you know, I do, I do think that the second Matrix movie, uh, uh, has, has misses in it. <laughs> I think overall, I don't necessarily think that it's a... Uh, like a masterpiece or anything like that. But it is weird that the, the uh, the movie isn't better, considering the fact that I think it has, it genuinely has, like, uh, six or seven of the greatest scenes ever filmed. <laughs> There's so much good in it. scene I'm guessing is one absolutely the freeway scene the uh, the fight in the uh, on the stairwell in the Merovingians uh, domain is another one um, people make fun of the uh, uh, the CG in the Agent Smith fight scene. <laughs> but uh, I genuinely think, like, choreography-wise and shots-wise, that's a miraculous scene. And it's funny, because even though, like, you know, the CG wasn't great at the time, and obviously that's not going to hold up <laughs> even more these days, but I feel like, genuinely and truly, I feel like that scene actually holds up better now. Here? Even the, like, effects. <laughs> Just because people are uh, kind of more used to... Uh, that specific type of wonky special effects. It's the kind of stuff that honestly, like, uh, would have really... Uh, fit in in, like, a... Uh, Like an action film from India, in a good way, in a good way, like, like an RRR. <laughs> the, the CG doesn't have to be perfect for it to be a good scene. Oh god. Smith fight scene degrades as it goes on. I disagree. I think it, like... I like, uh... I, 
I think as the scene goes on, the uh, the kinds of shots being pulled off get more and more uh, more and more impressive. Even back then, people mock it for looking like a PS2 game. Well, that's what I'm saying. Uh, like people made fun of it for the quote bad CG unquote back in the day. And I think that element of it has actually aged better. Specifically because I think people are more willing to uh, deal with bad CG if the scene itself is very good. <laughs> <clears throat> it sticks out more in The Matrix just because, uh, you know, it's a franchise known for its extremely good visual effects. Agent Smith fight is a thousand times better than any Marvel fight. Yeah. Just the imagination involved and the, uh, the choreography. it got that way because they cut corners on that scene uh i mean i remember watching like behind the scenes stuff i don't i don't think any corners were cut i think i think there was like limitations to the technology at the time and they they tried to mitigate that like if you watch how they filmed it a huge number of the agent smiths are just actors they're just lookalikes <laughs> It's it's not just a bunch of, like, CG Agent Smiths. A, bu a bunch of them are literally just actors. Um. <clears throat> yeah, there we go. But yeah, as long as you can get past the uh, the fact that it doesn't look 100% real, <laughs> what's actually happening in the scene is extremely fun. And like, they absolutely know how goofy the scene is. <laughs> the tone of it... The tone of it has a, uh, uh, a sort of Looney Tunes quality to it. And you could tell that they knew how goofy the scene is and that it's intentional because at some point, Neo throws one Agent Smith into a bunch of other Agent Smiths. And it makes a bowling pin <laughs> sound. It makes a bowling ball hitting a bunch of pins sound. <laughs> fourth movie. Yeah, I like the fourth movie, uh, ar artistically. I, I appreciate it when an artist is like, oh, right, I know what people want with a sequel to this, but I want to do an entirely different thing. <laughs> As someone who's constantly doing that myself, I have a lot of appreciation for that. I ever saw the third or fourth. I genuinely love the first Matrix film, and also, even with its faults, I love the second Matrix film. And I have a deep appreciation of the fourth Matrix film. I don't really like the third one. <laughs> it's been a while since I've seen it. <laughs> but the third one, uh... <clears throat> The third one I'm not not super into. I love Enter the Matrix. Enter the Matrix.
Let's, uh, let's enter the matrix. I love the Animatrix. The game. Oh yeah, which game was that? I played two Matrix games on stream. I like the ones with the big ants. That's one of my favorite licensed games I've ever played. Big Ant Matrix is Path of Neo. <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> uh, Path of Neo. Yeah, whole game, non-stop, buck-wild nonsense. If they did another Animatrix and asked you to do a segment, what would it be? <laughs> I cannot imagine they would ask me to do a segment for this. another Animatrix. I mean, I would absolutely agree. That's a good question. I would have to really think about this. I don't think that I'm necessarily a great fit for the Animatrix, but... I'd give it my all. Wachowskis. What if you're the Wachowskis? What are the Wachowskis up to? Probably just chilling. Probably just, just chilling out. Oh no! during the next Marvel. Yes, I will continue. I feel like... I genuinely feel like, uh, uh... Wachowski's doing a Marvel film wouldn't necessarily be very good. <laughs> not because they're not good filmmakers. Uh, because I think any all the, the good stuff that uh, they bring to movies is exactly the sort of stuff that would get left out of the Marvel pro process. Jupiter Rising was really all over the place. I love Jupiter Rising. I feel like, I mean, it's... Uh, I think that's a misunderstood movie. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know if people are familiar with, like, uh, uh, like F Flash Gordon. That kind of stuff.
Anyone, anyone familiar with Flash Gordon? It's honestly not a great film. I do actually think it is literally a great film. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so, if if you've seen the uh, the uh, the film version of Flash Gordon from the what is it the seventies? The Wachowskis were essentially making a modern Flash Gordon film for teen girls. <laughs> uh, Flash Gordon very, very clearly is a project put together specifically for teen boys. Jupiter, Jupiter Ascending. Jupiter Rising. <laughs> is, is that kind of project, but with teen girls specifically in mind. When you go into it with that sort of, uh, uh, ascending, yeah, it's ascending. <laughs> when you go into it with that kind of, uh, uh, mindscape, I guess. It, the the film takes on a, a, a different kind of uh, you understand what it's doing and how it's doing those things correctly and successfully yeah. dang it Marcus, thank you for the two dollars. I love Gordon. There's a new artist on the strip. I haven't, uh... I've read any Flash Gordon stuff in a very long time. How is, Cla how is Flash Gordon these days? You mentioned there's a new artist. How, how is it? I wouldn't consider myself, like, a, a big Flash Gordon fanatic or anything. I read a little bit after watching the movie. Which I, uh, which I liked. It's very good. That's good to hear. Genuinely had no idea they were they're still even doing Flash Gordon stuff. I mean, of course they are. Why wouldn't they? It's Flash Gordon. <laughs> Design Prince Royal to look like Idris Elba. Interesting. stuff for teen girls, but I also wish we could move away from generalizing what teen girls want from media. Uh, sure. Uh, my point with that is specifically that, um, a lot of people see this big, like, science fiction film 
and come with it, come to it with a certain understanding and language of like what makes a good version of that. <laughs> and that comes largely from uh, a, a specific kind of audience that is generally the one that is most dominantly catered to. And so when a, a big budget film comes out and is catering to a different type of taste, most of the reviewers that I saw, like, reviewing it, like, I, there was a, a, a handful of reviews that genuinely seemed to get what he was doing. And then most of the criticism that I saw from the ones that didn't seemed to be coming, uh, coming at it with, uh, expectations that the film was never attempting to, uh, you know, uh, attempting to achieve. Look at these heads. I imagine I need to shoot these heads. Oh no, 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 yeah. <laughs> Is this what I gotta do? I can't tell if I'm even hitting them. I assume I am, but... I was getting a little bit more feedback. God. Ah ha ha! That's good. Got him again. Got him another time. water. Oh, 
like the water. Personal annoyance. You're a teen girl who's gender non-conforming and queer. You get excluded when people talk about what teen girls want. Yeah, it's completely, completely fair. Oh my god. on those people. They're all gone. <laughs> They're all gone. Teen boy should also be made to watch and appreciate Jupiter's ending. <laughs> I think it's a movie that almost anyone could appreciate, but I do genuinely think that the uh, Wachowskis made it with a specific audience in mind. And uh, I think it's possible to appreciate the movie. on its own merits. Regardless of your demographic. But... It definitely isn't trying to do the, uh... the standard, uh... sci-fi film shtick. getting through this level. There's too many bullets, I just can't avoid them all. What's your opinion of their adaptation of V for Vendetta? They didn't direct that, right? It was a... It was a... producing thing. The 
screenplay, that's about it. Yeah, I don't remember exactly how involved they were. Um, I think it's a... Uh, I have I have two d very different opinions about it. <laughs> I think it has like uh, Watchmen movie levels of misunderstanding Alan Moore's uh, source material. <laughs> and at the same time, I do think it's a pretty good movie. <laughs> so, uh... Like, I feel like uh, the, the Watchmen film not only misunderstands, like, Alan Moore's source material, but ultimately doesn't really make any kind of salient points about anything because of that misunderstanding. The V for Vendetta movie, on the other hand, is uh, kind of attempts to construct its own uh, entirely un-Alan Moore uh, 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 meaning. And I think it is successful at that. Respecting the source material is not always a good measure of the quality of the film. No, but I think in an instance where the source material is very good and the changes made are very bad, <laughs> that is one way to judge a film. And like with the, uh, the, the Watchmen movie, I think the changes are bad and make the movie worse because of it. V for Vendetta, I think... I think it still ultimately works, even if it's an entirely different thing in the end. source material faithfully for anything. There's been a couple of adaptations that have been relatively uh, faithful. Uh, there was a movie version of uh, We've Always Lived in the Castle that makes a pretty significant change <laughs> To the ending, but still manages to stay faithful to the ideas of the story. It's not as good as the uh, the book, in my opinion. But you know, the book's one of my favorite books. And I think one of the greatest books ever written. No, it's... You've always lived in the castle. This is a entirely different... <laughs> Sorry, different different author. <clears throat> I was just talking about adaptations in general, not... Not just, uh, like, comic stuff. Or not... No. I, I never... I never read... Man in the High Castle. I don't, I don't even really know what that is. <laughs> was that a book or was that a comic? What was that? <laughs> I like the movie. 
the adaptation of Rebecca. Book and show. Book and show. Yeah, uh, the, it depends on what movie adaptation you're talking about. This is another example. Uh, okay, uh, Rebecca. The Alfred Hitchcock adaptation of Rebecca is actually pretty faithful outside of some haze code changes they had to make to the ending. But Daphne du Maurier uh, believed it to be the only good adaptation of their work. And I would agree. <laughs> Extremely good movie. The uh, more recent adaptation, one of the worst film adaptations of all time. <laughs> I don't say this lightly. <laughs> Just unbelievably bad film. a recent adaptation. Yeah, there was... It's a Philip K. Dick novel. Oh, yeah! It was a Philip K. Dick novel. Oh, no. Yeah, I haven't I haven't read that one. Alternate history about the Allies losing World War II, but there's more to it than that. Yeah, as someone who's read a lot of Philip K. Dick, I do imagine there's more to it than that. <laughs> there's always more to it than that. <clears throat> what are your thoughts about Zack Snyder's innate affinity for fascism? It's funny, I don't even think Zack St I don't think Zack Snyder's a fascist. <laughs> I just think all of his aesthetic appreciations are fascist. <laughs> I genuinely, truly do not believe that uh, Zack Snyder is a fascist, but he absolutely... He unknowingly loves all of the aesthetics of fascism. Like... <laughs> yeah. I think politically, he's probably... doesn't have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> Uh, I think it is it may kind of a bit of a head empty kind of guy. All right, well, I guess we'll start again. I don't even think, like, Zack Snyder's a bad artist or anything. <laughs> I think his absolute worst art is whenever he's taking on a project that requires someone to have a nuanced understanding of a, a metaphor.
here's here's what makes me think that Zack Snyder is genuinely a uh, a, a capital A artist, as in you know any any filmmaker working in Hollywood, even if they're making the absolute most corporate garbage, it's, they're still an artist. But are they a capital A artist? <laughs> And by capital A artist, I mean primarily a uh, an artist. This is their number one quality. <laughs> There's a lot of a lot of people in Hollywood who are primarily business people. <clears throat> They're a capital B business person who works in the art industry. It doesn't mean that they're not making art, but you know they're a business person. I think Zack Snyder is an artist, capital A artist. <laughs> and the reason I think this <clears throat> is uh, Zack Snyder said that he thought his uh, Justice League movie should be was he he thought inherently it was a black and white film, which is why there's a black and white version that you can watch of that movie. And, uh, that, that is how I watched it. And it's funny because it, it wasn't shot in black and white. <laughs> it's an extremely bad example of a movie being, like, uh, converted to black and white. It wasn't, it wasn't filmed with black and white in mind. <laughs> and yet, it's a black and white movie, he's right. <laughs> His artistic in instinct on this is absolutely correct. It wasn't shot well for black and white. <laughs> the cinematographer seems to have uh, disagreed with him <laughs> about this. It's just not really, uh, not really filmed in a way to lend itself for that. But at the same time, it is 100% a black and white film. <laughs> and this is not the sort of uh, this is not the sort of thing that a a business person would have uh, would have come up with. This is just capital A artist nonsense. <laughs> well, we're halfway through the stream. We're halfway through. Oh, there doesn't seem to be any birthdays today. I thought there was. I thought there was a birthday. There is not. Okay. It's classic artist nonsense. <laughs> it is absolutely. The Snyder Cut genuinely made me like Zack Snyder more even though I don't like the movie <laughs> there is a rebirth day today yeah it's true there's a, <laughs> it's a rebirth day although this is not the correct Easter this is not Greek Easter Greek, Greek Easter is another month. Refuse to watch Zack Snyder's four-hour ego boost. I would never in a million years try to talk someone into watching the Snyder Cut. <laughs> but, I will say, I don't think it's an ego boost. I think it's a genuine uh, artistic passion project. And I think it's... Uh, as much as I do not like any cut of the Justice League movie, the Snyder Cut is an order of magnitude better than the previous cut. <laughs> it's kind of unbelievable how much better it is. Although it still is not a good movie. But, you know, he, I, it's, a, it's, 
It, it is better. Says the F word, is that why? Yeah, it's it's better because Batman says the F word. Justice League feels like animated films and that it has all the DC staples featured in some way. Dialogue is poo, but it's possibly the best comic, comic movie. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. But the things I like about the things I like about the film. I like how slow and brooding it is. It's it's not slow in a like poorly paced way. It's slow in a, a lot of these characters have had their lives upended and don't really know what to do. <laughs> and Zack Snyder manages to uh, portray this in, I think, a, a fairly realistic and uh, compelling manner. Also, I think, you know, I think Zack Snyder is the Superman is garbage, but... <laughs> I think he does a good job of presenting Superman as this kind of terrifying alien. <laughs> That's not necessarily how Superman should be portrayed, but I think it, as in terms of execution of a vision, it, it pulls it off. Sky to fall, thank you for the 499. I would argue that there's not much function functional difference between appreciating fascist aesthetics and being an ideological fascist. Uh I think there's functional differences in terms of like your actual your actual actions. Like, uh, there's plenty of people who, uh, difference between a Civil War reenactor and a Civil War soldier. Yeah, I, that's, that's one way to put it. Like... I've known uh, different people uh, through the course of my life, and uh, like I've known war reenactors who really genuinely like the historical and aesthetic aspects of warfare. While at the same uh, time, politically, are anti-war, and would show up to uh, anti-war protests. And then I've also known people who really like the aesthetics of that stuff in a fetishistic way, where very clearly <laughs> it's like they just really like war. And I think the same thing is the case with like uh, 
the appreciation of the aesthetics of fascism. The stuff skeeves me out, but I don't think someone like Zack Snyder is <laughs> indistinguishable from a fascist because of it. Charles, thank you for the $49.99. Hi, Jason. Sorry I'm late. I was seeing the new Godzilla X Kong movie with the family. It was silly and basically an expensive CGI WWE movie. Hope you're enjoying my submission. I was trying to find you a fun old NES title I played as a kid. Well, thank you so much, Charles. Glad you, glad you enjoyed the movie. Yeah, this game's pretty fun. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> I got to a point where I, I got reasonably far, but ran out of continues. But it's it's very good. It's a lot of fun. stuff from fascism are stolen from a lot of other cultures, especially like the Roman. Oh yeah, fascists love... the Romans. Fascists tend to talk a lot about how much they hate fascism. Uh... I think you're talking specifically about crypto fascists. Uh, so there, there's a, a type of fascist that, uh, for political or social reasons, hide their uh, ideolo ideological ideas because of the uh, personal impact it would have on them. <laughs> Yeah, the crypto fascists that's that's the uh, the term for them but there are plenty of open fascists who very directly uh, voice support for fascism as a political ideology And as fascism becomes more uh, socially acceptable through various political connivings, a lot of crypto fascists stop being crypto fascists and <laughs> become outspoken fascists. We've seen this happening in the United States a bunch, where it used to be primarily crypto fascist. We got a lot of uh, out and open fascists here. Empire. There's a, uh, Kurt Vonnegut book. I forgot what the book is, but there's a quote in it that keeps getting repeated throughout the book. The Empire Never Ended. It's a good book, and that concept in particular is good. The idea being that the Roman Empire never actually ended. Not in a conspiratorial means, <laughs> but like, uh, not that the literal, actual Roman Empire never ended, but instead, what the Empire added to the world has continued on through uh, modern empires like the United States. It's functionally the same legacy.
became the Catholic Church. I mean, the Holy Roman Empire was... <laughs> <laughs> this is this is the Catholic Church uh, kind of <clears throat> I don't I don't think it's necessary I I think uh, become is a weird word it's I think if you kill someone and then Where's that? The, the, the Catholic Church basically talented Mr. Ripley, the Roman Empire. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess they did become the Catholic Church. Kind of. view of history is more or less we messed up so far back that even our attempts to fix up the messed up things are tainted by how messed up we are now. <laughs> yeah, we did mess up things pretty far back. It's buck wild to think about the fact that, you know, a lot of the things that we consider just part of human nature, a lot of the hierarchical structures that we build into our society and stuff, weren't actually there from the beginning. If you look back at, like, the uh, the absolute furthest civilizations that we have any kind of information on, uh, like, there are uh, ruins from extremely, extremely early human civilizations where it's very clear that nobody lived in a way that was is fundamentally different from the way that other people would live. So there's there's whole communities built where each of the uh, the housing areas are effectively the same size. It's not to say that these people didn't have uh, leadership <laughs> or uh, different roles or, or whatever. It's just fundamentally people didn't live above others in in practical terms this just wasn't a thing at the point at that point <laughs> so it's uh we really don't have to live like this <laughs> this isn't like it isn't a given that uh, a more equitable society would inevitably fall to some sort of, like, inherent bad instincts. democracy in ancient Greece. Well, let's not uh, give the ancient Greek. <laughs> I am Greek, and I love to take credit for all of humanity's greatest triumphs. <laughs> but... <laughs> uh, let me tell you, they absolutely had uh, a true and complete uh, definite democracy for 
a very small subset of people. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the number of people considered people for the purposes of democracy. Not as large as you might hope. I would now live in a world where I can watch Perfect Husbands. Glad you like Perfect Husbands. Yeah, I, I gotta be doing a bunch of those episodes. Not sure when the next one's gonna come out, but... Gonna be, it's gonna be a good number. That's why I'm very critical of the we the people in the American Constitution in the last few years. Yeah, it's, you know, it's the same kind of deal. Like, we the people meeting a very small, small section. <laughs> it really is like, uh, uh, just, you know, this inherent belief that some people are people and some people are not people. exists in the world, but USA isn't in the top ten of that list. Yeah, there's actually an organization that just straight up monitors uh, levels of democracy in countries, and, like, there, there's plenty of countries that have a functional democracy. It doesn't mean that they don't have problems or structural issues or whatever, but like, they qualify as a democracy. They are democratic. <laughs> the United States... The United States is uh, primarily an oligarchy. Oh no! how this game is set up. <laughs> like, me mechanics-wise. It's very good. Let me talk about something lighthearted. Yeah, why not? Let's see, what's a good lighthearted thing to talk about? Uh, we brought up Godzilla earlier. Godzilla vs. Kong. I've been watching through uh, all of the Godzilla films. I started watching uh, Return of Godzilla, the first in the uh, Heiwei era. Gotta finish that tonight. Here's something extraordinary about the movie Return of Godzilla. I think it's Heisei. There we go. Thank you. I appreciate it. The Heisei era. <laughs> I just can't get it right. <laughs> uh, Return of Godzilla is shot extremely well. So the cinematography is, is very good. It's just a very well filmed movie. 
and I think it's extremely funny. The movie goes on for like uh, a full like 40 minutes or something before uh, before Godzilla shows up. And when Godzilla shows up, it's a little startling, given how well everything else looked, to suddenly have this extremely goofy rubber suit monster. <laughs> like, I don't think they should have done anything differently. I think this is exactly how the movie should have been. But... <laughs> it did kind of make me laugh out loud a little bit when Godzilla showed up. I was like, there he is! There's Godzilla. Oh no, dang it. Uh, Boombot, thank you for the two Canadian. I love Mothra. She is strong. I do love Mothra, yeah. Mothra's one of the best. I really think they need to bring her uh, tiny women priestesses back to sing their, sing their Mothra song. Watch the version with Raymond Burr or without, without of re Return of Godzilla. I'm watching the uh, whatever the whatever the Japanese version is. I didn't think there were <laughs> Raymond Burr. I didn't even know there was, a uh, multiple versions of that movie. Heavily re-edited, localized version, Godzilla 1985 is released in the United States. Yeah, no, that's not, that's not the one. That's not the one I'm watching. <laughs> yeah, I'm watching the the uh, I'm watching the Japanese version. Yeah, I. I Yeah, that's that's not. I'm not. I'm not seeing the the Raymond Burr version. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I've got. Uh, I've been watching most of these movies legally, but there's a couple that are just not available. And when I've sought those out, I've specifically sought the, the Japanese version. So I guess I. It got lucky here, because I didn't even realize there was an American cut of this. Like, uh... Godzilla, or Godzilla vs. King Kong, or Godzilla 2000. Priestess so badly. I, I can't believe that those characters haven't come back in some form. I mean, I understand why they wouldn't, but it's all for bad reasons. People won't accept that for some reason there's tiny women <laughs> who pray to Mothra. <laughs> they will accept it. They'll accept it and they'll uh, cherish it. to popular belief Godzilla vs. Kong at the same ending in both releases. I thought it was just a difference of like one sound effect. Like I, th I thought the only difference was 
Godzilla roars in one and doesn't in the other. Minus one. Glad it has an Oscar under its belt. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing minus one. At this point, I'm, I'm gonna see every Godzilla film. I've seen most of them already. It's just a matter of going through the ones I haven't yet. appreciate the English dub of Godzilla 2000 because the dialogue was punched up to be more humorous, but the reality is Toho had approved and enjoyed the changes. I can, I can both believe that Toho approved and enjoyed the changes, and also the things that the jokes weren't all that great. <laughs> I, I have mixed feelings on Godzilla 2000. I've seen, I've seen both versions, the Japanese and the, uh, the American version. Uh, it's really, it, it's only a few lines. Yeah, it isn't, it isn't that much different. The, uh, the, uh, the difference in in dialogue. I don't I don't I don't necessarily like the changes, but I don't think that it ruins the movie or anything. I think uh the the thing that makes the movie so interesting to me that I think is also the worst part of the movie is it genuinely truly has some of the worst digital compositing. <laughs> <laughs> in, in, a, in a commercially released film. <laughs> I I was watching the movie uh, like just a couple days ago and I'm someone who at the time the movie came out had access to the compositing software that the movie used. through piracy. <laughs> and I did a lot of my own digital compositing. And it was wild watching that movie as an adult and being like, oh my god. <laughs> they... <laughs> they tracked this shot by hand with keyframes. <laughs> There's so many shots of Godzilla where, like, they they have a shot of, like, a beach or something that they've added Godzilla to. And the way that it's digitally composited is, is Godzilla's, like, green screened. And then someone in the compositing software is manually, manually moving Godzilla around frame by frame in the program, <laughs> setting keyframes. <laughs> and doing a pretty bad job of it. <laughs> it's such a, a, a different look than like the uh, uh, all of the previous eras of Godzilla effects and stuff uh, where the compositing is uh, being done cheaply but by people who uh, genuinely know what they're doing so that even though the uh, the process itself is is cheap. It's still it's still uh, absolute experts putting it together <laughs> on a very small budget. <laughs> With Godzilla 2000, I think the people doing the compositing had just learned the software. 
<laughs> because the, the choices they make in terms of how to do the compositing are the same choices that I made in the software when I was a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I love watching that movie now. It has like there's a nostalgia for me, <laughs> but like a software nostalgia. <clears throat> there's so many like green screen shots too, where like a part of the green screen uh, is. Like they haven't lit it correctly. They've done. They've somehow in previous Godzilla films when there's green screening, generally they knew what they were doing and they they knew how to light for a green screen. They didn't know how to light for a green screen in Godzilla 2000. You, you need to light the green screen separately from the subject, because otherwise the uh, the light from the green screen uh, bounces back onto the subject, and part of the subject ends up disappearing <laughs> because it's. It's green now. <laughs> this happens constantly in Godzilla 2000. <laughs> it's unbelievable. <clears throat> Got him. Here. Godzilla 2000. I think it's the second last Godzilla movie for a while. Godzilla 2000? That one was, believe it or not, that was the start of it. I don't know if, if you're referring to that movie or not. It was the start of the Millennium Era. Or, some people say the uh, Matthew Broderick film was the start of the Millennium Era. <laughs> it was a response. Uh, like, the, the Matthew Broderick one uh, w was so buck wild, not Godzilla, that Toho put together their own film in response and it started up a whole a whole new era of Godzilla the millennium era I think a lot of the millennium era uh, the films are pretty good if not great although I haven't seen the final wars yet that, that was Final Wars before 2000. No, Final Wars was the end of the Millennium Era. So 2000 is what kicked it off, and Final Wars is what ended it. Final Wars was the last one before the, the current era. Yeah, Godzilla 2000... It's 99, and then Godzilla vs. Megaguirus <laughs> came out the next year. And then 2001, the, uh, the masterpiece Godzilla, Mothra, and King Ghidorah, giant monsters all out attack. Followed by Godzilla against Mechagodzilla the next year. Godzilla Tokyo SOS the year after that. And finally, Godzilla Final Wars in 2004. I think Godzilla 2000 is an interesting movie, especially in the context of, like, Toho being annoyed at <laughs> what the, the Americans did with Godzilla <laughs> and wanting to do a, a proper one. I mean, Godzilla 2000 is absolutely a proper, a proper Godzilla film. The compositing is just really bad. In many ways, I think it makes the film funner to watch now. Like, 
it's ju it's just real goofy. <laughs> it's just real goofy looking. Godzilla enters the digital compositing age. I saw that movie in theaters when it came out in the United States, Godzilla 2000. <clears throat> it's it's funny to me that of all the Godzilla, Japanese Godzilla movies to get a US release that, that that would be that would be one of them. There's only been like what four that have ever had a US release and one of them is <laughs> Godzilla 2000. <laughs> Have you watched Godzilla vs. Biolante yet? No, that one's uh, that one's next on my list. That one's one I haven't seen. Uh, I I also tried to get that one legally, but that one's also out of print apparently. Uh, Sony had the rights to the Heisei era, uh, and has slowly been letting those expire and so so many so many of those films are just out of print now but i managed to track down a a rip of the uh the blu-ray so i'm gonna watch that in high quality soon There's a, there's a bunch of these that uh, very uh, kind people have put, just put up on <laughs> archive.org. So a lot of these movies you can just watch there. That's where I downloaded a number of these. They're just <laughs> on archive.org. <laughs> it's... A little tricky to search for them on archive.org because the way the results come up. Uh, but if you search the movie title and then archive.org on Google, uh, you you get uh, easier access to the correct results. Jason talking about American Godzilla. It's been so long since I've seen American Godzilla, like the Matthew Broderick one. I'm gonna watch that one again as part of my current Godzilla binge. I really like that... I, I haven't seen Final Wars, so I don't actually know how this... I, I believe that they took the Matthew Broderick Godzilla and put it in that movie, and they changed the name to Zilla for the reason that... Uh, the Americans took the god out of Godzilla <laughs> and just made it a big lizard. Okay, I can just run them over nice. Suggesting that Roland Emmerich's Godzilla adaptation wasn't very faithful. <laughs> I know. It's so weird. I Roland Emmerich is, is someone who uh, genuinely like added a lot to the disaster film genre, and it's buck wild how he took the originator of the genre. Like one of its defining beginnings and made such a lackluster <laughs> film out of it.
it's kind of like when John Woo made a bad Mission Impossible movie. <laughs> it's like, how, how exactly did this happen? Mission Impossible. Mission Impossible 2. <clears throat> it's just like, you've picked the exact right director for this, but it, it's bad. How? <laughs> it's the same vibe as that live action Super Mario Brothers movie, Godzilla, that is. I haven't seen it in a while, but I suspect you're exactly right. That's kind of what I remember about the about the movie. Scene in MI2 was Tom Cruise's idea. Yeah, I mean, of course it was. <laughs> we were 100% convinced they were gonna kill Tom Cruise, but Cruise refused to take no for an answer. Yeah, that's every Mission Impossible movie. Tom Cruise demands to do something that's gonna get himself killed. And <laughs> I think I think that's why it's been the same director for the last however many movies, because Tom Cruise finally found a director who just would go along with all of the absolutely uh, definitely gonna kill Tom Cruise stunts. <laughs> I think it's literally just the guy's just never gonna say no to Tom Cruise in terms of stunt work. He just drove a motorcycle off a cliff in the last one. He just straight up a whole cliff drove a motorcycle straight off it he didn't have a wire or anything he had a, a parachute drove a motorcycle off had to be authentic. It had to look like Tom Cruise was literally driving off a cliff. It's a good shot. Makes me want to like Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise is as it's a uh, absolutely 100% a uh, an artist who absolutely loves film as a as an art form. I'm sure he's a bad person to be around. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure he's a real bad, rough person to be in the proximity of. But, uh... 
he is uh, probably the, the like one of one of uh, cinema's greatest stunt people. And truly, uh, uh, someone who understands film as an as an art form. Terrible people make brilliant things. <laughs> yeah, for the most part, the uh, the idea of like the uh, uh, the idea of the uh, uh, abuse of genius it doesn't really exist. Like most of those people are also incompetent. <laughs> And nothing about the, uh, the genius would excuse the abuse. But for the most part, I think that most of the people described that way are not actually geniuses. <laughs> I think Tom Cruise is genuinely uh, as good a stunt person and filmmaker as you can possibly be. And also, he's definitely a pretty, by all accounts, abusive person to be around. Godzilla movies free on Tubi. That's nice. That's good to know. Son of a gun. Tubi. Here we go, here we go. Get out of my way. Get the heck out of here. Get the heck out of here. Deserted the Earth Sea earlier this week. It's really wonderful. Yeah, it's a really, really good, good book. Great series. One of my favorites. I don't think there's really anything by Ursula Le Guin that I didn't. It might not be anything that I didn't love. I just love Ursula Le Guin's writing in general. I've read a, a ton of them, and there's definitely 
there's definitely stuff that I have less affection for, but there's so many, so, there's so many of her novels that are just near the top of my list. So many personal favorites. <laughs> oh my guys! Got him. Just gonna study the stream, and all the discussion has been pretty focused. Yeah, this is a good, a good game to talk on. Not because the game itself isn't engaging; it is extremely engaging. But it's also so well designed. <laughs> like, I find myself able to speak even in intense battle scenes just because it's like. There's not there's not a lot of randomness to what's happening. I feel like I've got a, a handle on it, even when it's being chaotic. I'm doing bad now. <laughs> we're we're near the end end of this. Uh, is there a novel or series of books you'd recommend? Uh, you'd have to be more specific than that. I I read in a lot of different genres. Like, oh, the reason you didn't drop the guys off at a chopper stop. Oh, I just forgot this time. <laughs> yeah, I just forgot. I mean, I read 100 books a year. <laughs> Literally 100. I read exactly 100 books a year. There's there's a ton. Uh, if, you, if you're looking for, like, a specific kind of recommendation, I got all sorts. It's just... Uh, you know, as, as much as I love Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca... I'm not 100% sure that that's, like, gonna hit for everyone who... <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't necessarily know that that's the right recommendation for you. Yearly 100 books. Yeah, I got... That's the uh, goal I set myself every year. <laughs> it's the most violent book. This is the most violent book. I, 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 I don't actually read a lot of horror. So... That would be a hard one for me to answer. <laughs> the, Bi the Bible. The Bible is actually the most <laughs> violent, violent book. Think about that one. Uh, 
Uh, I posted one second. A while back, I posted a. Uh, Posted a list on Twitter of some of my favorite books. Oh, this guy's coming after me. Come on. I'll just read off that list. Daphne du Maurier, Rebecca. <laughs> Daphne du Maurier, The Scapegoat. Shirley Jackson, Haunting of Hill House. Shirley Jackson, We've Always Lived in the Castle. Shirley Jackson, the Sundial, Ursula Le Guin, The Telling, Ursula Le Guin, The Lathe of Heaven, Ursula Le Guin, The Dispossessed, all three of those, just incredible, Mary Renault, The Last of the Wine, Mary Renault, The Mask of Apollo, Octavia Butler, Dawn, uh, Ian M. Banks, or, yeah, is that how you... <laughs> I, the Scottish names. <laughs> Is it La Lane? Lane? My god. A player of game. I, I can't pronounce Scottish names. My apologies to the Scots. <laughs> I, I always get them wrong every single time, no matter what the name is. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Emily Bronte, Wuthering Heights. Philip K. Dick, Ubik. Herman Melville, Moby Dick. I almost certainly understand. Thank, thank you, Rebecca, on behalf of <laughs> Scott. Anne Rice, Memnock the Devil. I think I think that's actually your masterpiece. A controversial book in the Vampire Chronicles series, but I think it's literally the best thing she ever wrote. Uh, <laughs> Mervyn Peake, Titus Groan, Madeline Miller, The Song of Achilles, uh, Carolyn uh, Tebeck, uh, Anatka, Nettie Akorafor, uh, Akata Warrior, Anne Leckie, Ancillary Justice, Anne Leckie, The Raven Tower, Tasman Muir, Nona the Ninth, Donna Tart, The Secret History, and yeah, the Juna Barnes, Nightwood. It's Ian Jason. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marcus. I figured you'd know. I thought it was Ian, but then I remembered I mispronounce Scottish names all the time, so <laughs> I second-guessed myself, and I shouldn't have. something else. Also started Rebecca yesterday. It's great. Yeah. I love it. It, is, it is a great book, yes. <laughs> I'm glad you like Nightwood. I, I love... Nightwood is uh, one of the most extraordinary novels I've ever read. we're at the end here. Thank you again, Charles, for sending this in. This is just an absolute joy to play. I feel like this is one of those games that I'm gonna just pick up on my own at some point and just start playing again. <laughs> so good. Special thanks to the FilmCal Patreon supporters. Greatly appreciate the support.
be back tomorrow. We are going to continue Alias on the Xbox. Tune in for that, Alias. Couldn't read anything else for a while after Nightwood. It's like nothing else <laughs> compares. <laughs> yeah, Night Nightwood will do that for you. I would, uh... Every once in a while, you read a book by a writer who just, like... It feels like they ascended to some other plane to write it. <laughs> there's, there's some times in which I'll, uh, like, read a book or watch a movie or, or something, and I'll think to myself, like, I could do some... I could do something like... I could do something like this. I could never write anything like even approaching Nightwood. It's <laughs> impossible. I'm so <laughs> even even at my very best artistically, it's like I'm just not gonna reach not gonna reach that level. <laughs> it's, it's outside of my it's solidly outside of my range. The game's a slightly hidden gem. Don't hear it talked about lately. Yeah, I don't. I don't see this one often coming up on on lists and stuff. But boy, it's it's very good. You ever tried reading Roger Zelani? Zelanzi, sorry, Roger Zelanzi. Uh, I don't think so. Let me look up Larger Zalanzi. Zalanzi. Zalazny. I'm adding letters here. <laughs> I'm mixing up letters. Roger Zalan Z Zalazny. No, I don't. I don't think I've read any of uh, Zelazny stuff. Is this, this uh, author you'd recommend, Marcus? Not enough films end with the main character walking out into the ocean. The movie just fades to black. Godzilla is just that great of an actor. <laughs> uh, Godzilla is truly a... Truly a treasure. I like that there's a couple of Godzilla films from the Showa era. Where originally Godzilla wasn't going to be in it. And... <laughs> There was some sort of issue with either, like, they thought this movie wouldn't sell, or there was another character that was supposed to be in it that they lost, the, didn't have the rights to it because uh, of complicated legal reasons. And Godzilla just kind of gets added to the movie. And... <laughs> I, I love the idea that at, if, if you were working on a, uh, a Toho film at the time, uh... Even if it wasn't a Godzilla film, it was entirely possible that Godzilla could show up in your movie at some point unexpectedly. <laughs> you could be filming a movie that has nothing to do with Godzilla, and then all of a sudden Godzilla's there. <laughs> you show up to work one day and... Yeah, Godzilla's in the movie now. <laughs> Godzilla's here. I know this wasn't a Godzilla movie, but it is, it is now. Anyway, that should happen more often. We should, in many ways, we should go back to the Showa Godzilla era. go back to the era of a studio having a, a lot that they film movies on 
and uh, a movie could be one character fighting another character. <laughs> Let's do it. An important part of this is actually filming stuff instead of it all being CG, but... Will this happen again? Who knows? I want Godzilla in the next Mission Impossible. <laughs> Just add Godzilla to stuff. Genuinely want to see a modern costume effects Godzilla movie with a 3D printed city. Yeah. Yeah, I really hope we uh, we get one of those. Shin Godzilla was almost, uh, almost a suit Godzilla. They did try out some suits and didn't, ended up not using them. Except for, for a couple of effects shots. But, and I mean, that, that movie's excellent as is, but. I'd love for them to uh, do uh, lower budget suit Godzilla films. Just get back to making miniatures and stuff. <laughs> what? I, I I love seeing those uh, miniature cities that <clears throat> were built for these movies. Just all the detail that went into them. It's just impressive looking at it. It's funny, because when I watch, like, a CG film and CG stuff is happening, like, uh, people put a lot of work into the uh, 3D models that they generate and stuff, but I never find it as impressive as the people who put the work into uh, uh, physical models. <laughs> it's like, even though, even though, like, when you think about it, like, a, a big CG Godzilla film has... <laughs> The amount of people working on it is unbelievable. The amount of work that goes into those films is just off the charts. It's like a thousand people <laughs> are doing the special effects. <laughs> so uh, from that perspective, it's like a, this, a way more work is going into the CG stuff. But still, I find myself being more impressed by the uh, however many people who built the tiny sets that a guy in a suit would then stomp around. There's just something about seeing something that was actually there and actually getting <laughs> getting stepped on by a guy in a suit. I'd like to see a well-done suit Godzilla. I want to see how far practical effects can go now. Yeah, it would be pretty cool. To see a uh, modern, uh, like filmmaking capabilities but with uh, practical effects entirely in mind I just uh, just love those movies truthfully if I had if I had like the uh, the money to do this <laughs> I <laughs> I'm the sort of person who, uh, if I, if I had the funds right now, after seeing these, these Shoho Godzilla films, I'm, I'm all pumped up right now. I'm like, you know what, we, we, we uh, not Shoho, Sh Showa, the Showa era uh, Godzilla films. I'm like, we need this, we need this to come back. This has to come back. <laughs> it's, it's imperative this comes back. I would be constructing a, a studio set specifically to film these movies. You know, you need the big water tank. You need the, the huge water area so Godzilla can be walking around the water. It, obviously, I wouldn't get, have the rights to Godzilla, but, you know, kaiju films. You'd have to have the big water tank. You'd have to have the, uh, the sets where you can create uh, uh, landscapes for the kaiju to walk around the areas to film the uh, 
The city's being destroyed. And like once you get that stuff built, you can just you can just film these back to back. You can make make a ton of them. The actual the actual budget for those movies, you know, is absolute chump change compared to what, <laughs> what films cost now. <laughs> How much did the first Godzilla movie cost? Yeah, the it's like four hundred thousand uh, dollars. With inflation, that it, it goes up, but we're talking about like less than uh, even even with inflation, we're talking about less than Paul Blart Mall Cop money <laughs> to, make, <laughs> to make these movies. Uh, if I won the lottery, I'd produce my own rubber suit Godzilla movie. It's a great use of the money, honestly. Excellent use of, <laughs> of money. <clears throat> well, I guess that's it. I guess that's all for tonight. Had a great time streaming. Thank you again, Charles, for the the game. Is there a film cow kaiju? There... It, I don't think there is. I could come up with one. I could come up with a kaiju. I gotta think about this. As if this is this is like a secret dream of mine now. So I gotta I gotta get working on the the mindscape part of it. I really gotta be thinking. <laughs> I, gotta, I really gotta be thinking hard about what a film cow kaiju would be. I think my very favorite Godzilla thing is just here's 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 what I love about the Showa era Godzilla. <laughs> I like both. I I do like the Godzilla where Godzilla is, uh, you know, a terror destroying a city. Uh, but I also extremely like Godzilla when Godzilla's <laughs> a friend. <laughs> but like Godzilla is kind of a, a like Godzilla gets a little. Uh, excuse my language here, pissy sometimes. <laughs> There's a lot of personality to Godzilla in the Showa era. Uh, I forget the name of the guy who did the suits uh, uh, stuff for nearly all of the Showa era films, except for the last two. He's a grumpy dad. <laughs> yeah, he gets he gets pretty uh, he gets pretty grump <laughs> grumped up. <laughs> And, uh, I just feel like so much of, uh, Godzilla over the last however many years is really just only angry. I don't know. I want to see a, a larger range of emotions from Godzilla. I like it when God Godzilla has, like, gets annoyed I like it when Godzilla gets annoyed or is sleepy. <laughs> I like it when Godzilla laughs at something. So, if I was coming up with a uh, film cow kaiju, I'd, I would want to come up with one who had a a range of a range of emotional responses to things. It wouldn't just be a monster stomping around. Godzilla having an extreme, extreme existential crisis could be interesting. <laughs> yeah, I think existentialism is something I would definitely add to the to the kaiju 
kaiju franchise. Casual Godzilla is peak cinema. I do, I, I do love Godzilla trying to sleep uh, after trying to teach his terrible son how to be less terrible. <laughs> they nail that part of Godzilla. The new film with the uh, the King Kong one. I mean, that's good to hear if that's if that's true. a horse or a centaur it's a femboy it's a femboy horse it's a fe femboy horse all right well i'm gonna head off thank you all for tuning in have a great night everyone a great morning afternoon evening whatever it is Wherever you are, have a good one. Farewell, everyone. I love you all.